from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I wish to welcome you here to the African Middle Eastern Division uh, on behalf of my colleagues in the division and in particular our chief, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb. It is definitely a pleasure to see you all here. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section, one of the three sections of the African Middle Eastern Division. The other two sections are the Hebraic section, which is responsible for developing the collection and providing reference about uh, Hebraic material in Judaica worldwide, and uh, the African section, uh, which is responsible for developing the collection from and about Sub-Saharan Africa and providing reference uh, assistance and access to that material. And then, as I said, I'm the head of the Near East section. The Near East section is responsible for developing the collection from and about the Arab world, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Tajikistan, and Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans. The collection of the Near East section uh, aggregates about 480,000 volumes, approximately one half are in Arabic. Uh, there are about 75 to 80,000 volumes each in Persian and Turkish, and then uh, in another 36 languages, there are uh, anywhere from, say, 30,000 Armenian books down to, I think we have a dozen books in Ingush, a language of the North Caucasus. As I mentioned, the staff here not only is responsible for developing the collection, but it is responsible for providing reference services and access to the collections. And if you are doing research about uh, any of the subjects of the African Middle Eastern Division, any of the areas for which we are responsible, certainly please come and uh, visit us and uh, talk to our specialists and reference librarians. Another thing that we do, and which is another responsibility of the staff of the division, is to make our collections known more widely to the public. And to that end, among the things we do is to have these noontime lectures in which individuals who uh, have done research on interesting topics and sometimes uh, hopefully have done that research here uh, are asked by the staff uh, who arranges for them to give uh, these presentations. Uh, now today's presentation has been arranged by uh, Noel Kawar, who is the uh, Senior Reference Librarian for Arabic in the Near East section. And she will introduce today's presenter. So without further ado, I would like to ask Noel to come forward and say some things about our guest. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. It's really a pleasure today to have our guest speaker Dr. Rauf Abu Jaber, all the way from Amman, Jordan. Dr. Abu Jaber is a distinguished historian of 19th century Transjordan. He obtained his BBA from American University in Beirut and an MA from Jordan University and PhD from Oxford University, England in 1987. He published 11 books and the author of over 100 articles in both English and Arabic. Library of Congress has already received and cataloged all of his books. I would like to mention only a few of them. Pioneers over Jordan, History of Transjordan and its economy during the 19th and mid 19th century, Arab Christians in Jerusalem, History of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, to mention only a few of them. In addition, he is the author of other interesting books, such as biographies of well-known families in Transjordan and Jordan, especially those families who contributed to the development of Jordan itself. 
In addition to his scholarly work, Dr. Abu Jaber is a leading industrialist and an accomplished businessman. He was several times president of the General Arab Insurance Federation and president of the Jordan Insurance Federation between 1996 and 2000. He is the founder of and president general investment company limited with Dutch participation in 1955 and the Jerusalem Development Investment Company Limited. He is also the founder of the holding company Messrs. Saad Abu Jaber and Sons. For 35 years, from 1960 to 1995, Dr. Abu Jaber was Honorary Consul General of the Netherlands in Jordan. He is a founder, member, and chairman of many other community life associations. He is the president of the Orthodox Central Council founded in 1992 and was governor of the Rotary District 2450, whatever that means. He has been president of the Orthodox Philanthropic Society supervising two youth centers since 1969. He was also active in several other educational associations, including being honorary vice president of Jordan Turkish Friendship Society, Vice President of the Friends of Jordan Universities Society, and member of Jordan's Foreign Affairs Council since 1978. His decorations included the following titles. Highest rank independence order granted by His Majesty King Hussein in 1995. Commander of the Order of Orange Nassau granted by Her Majesty Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands in 1980. And Officer of the Order of Orange Nassau granted by Her Majesty Queen Julian of the Netherlands in 1970. In brief, I introduce to you our distinguished speaker, Dr. Abdel. Thank Abu you Jaber. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is really an honor for me to be standing here and to address you on this important subject of Jordan and its development. The Arab Spring that we have been witnessing for the last two and a half years has left many questions about Jordan. People are wondering all the time, <coughs> the map is there? The map is here. Yeah. Start with the map. Yeah. People are wondering all the time, what's happening in Jordan? How is it going to tackle its problems? How are they going, these poor Jordanians, when I, may, I mean wealth-wise, they are poor, manage with two and a half million refugees or uh, incoming visitors on their hands in a country that is merely six million people in number. All these questions have made us in Jordan think of the reasons that have brought about these different aspects of development and the effect that they will leave on our final results. Now, I have here in front of me the map, and I want to explain uh, the weather conditions that have led mainly to the poverty of Transjordan. Most of the land east, 20 kilometers east of Amman, is uh, waste, it's badia, it's a desert, where the rainfall can drop up to 50 millimeters per annum. But the Jordan Valley, which has been intensively uh, settled uh, after the projects of the dams and the canals in, in the 60s, uh, it is, of course, irrigational. There is no rainfall in the Jordan Valley, which, is, which goes up to nearly 400 meters before, below sea level. But on the plateau, just on the hills east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, the rainfall for a stretch of around 30 to 40 kilometers may be up to 600 
millimeters annually in the higher areas and 250 millimeters in the more eastern areas. And uh, the <coughs> remark has been made by the meteorologists that rainfall in Jordan decreases going south and is more in the areas where the altitude is higher than 800 meters. And these are few in Jordan. Now, this is an idea about the terrain in Jordan as it was 200 years ago. This is the Amman landscape. And the spring in the uh, <laughs> picture is Ras al Ain. That is the supply of water supply of Amman. It's no more there because the whole place is now urban areas, very highly settled place. This is the Amman Audion, which is next to the Amman Amphitheater. Uh, the Jordanian countryside was very important for the settlers who came from Macedonia after the conquest of Alexander the Great in the east. They came as retired people, and uh, they say that uh, the word yacherese in Greek is uh, the retired, and that's why they called Jarash Kherese after the retired of the soldiers of Alexander. They, the city, Jarash, was famous, and Philadelphia was famous, and they were all members of seven cities of the Decapolis, the alliance of 10 cities that were in Jordan. One of them was in Palestine at uh, Bisan, and one of them was in Syria, uh, two of them were in Syria, one at Fik in the Jolan, and one at Qanawat, south of Damascus. This is the water spring in Amman with the old building of the Nymphaeum, where the rich and wealthy of the town used to go and have their baths daily. When the Turks came to Jordan in the year 1518, the countryside uh, was under the Mamluks and was neglected. There were no roads, so the people did not know the wheel, and there were no uh, bridges or aqueducts until the year, perhaps, 1884, when the Ottomans built this bridge in the city of Amman because it became a Circassian settlement and they were uh, forced to build this so that they can cross from one side to the other during the six months of winter. But much older than uh, that bridge by around 4,000 years is this monolithic, mm -hmm. megalithic building known as Al Malfouf. Al Malfouf is the one that is wrapped around. And this was a structure I remember one of them that is still standing opposite the Department of Antiquities in Amman itself. Uh, we had few of them in the vicinity of Amman, and they were made of large blocks of stone in a rounded figure. And there are two theories. One is that they were uh, the defensive apparatus for a settlement, or uh, the house of the chief with his guards. But uh, amazing that these malfoofs have, because of the development in the settling, and settling in Amman, have disappeared with the exception of this one that's left around. It's a pity. The picture that you see now <coughs> is the market uh, in downtown Amman during the 30s. I remember this in 1936 as a young um, boy 
uh, where we used to cross the water in the sail in the valley on stones, jumping from one stone to the other. There was no bridge. But the, I, I, could, I, could, I remember now that sometimes we had over 1,500 to 2,000 animals gathered all together in that area and people buying and selling a herd of cattle or a flock of sheep or a camel or a mule. And it was a very convenient way. Every Thursday, uh, people gathered there and exchanged goods. I want to speak now about the population composition that was there in uh, the start of the 19th century. Uh, there was a famous traveler, Burkhardt. He, he was Swiss, sent by the Palestine Exploration Fund in 1812 to Egypt, Syria, and Transjordan and Palestine as well. And he wrote wonderful books and made ex especially good reports about the population. I made a study, a survey of his reports, and found out that the whole area of Transjordan, a, a place of 96,000 square kilometers, had around 100,000 people only. Half of them were nearly uh, uh, settlers, half settlers and the other were completely nomadic Bedouins. These people lived on little farming, but mainly on animal husbandry. They could have had over 20,000 camels, and they could have had perhaps 50,000 sheep. And that was the whole economy that Jordan had during that period. The country was already under tribal law for 200 years or more. And the place was divided into three parts. The north, where they had mashikhat, chiefdoms. Every big clan managed to control a certain area. And that will be the Bataina area. That will be the Frihat area, Ajlun. That will be Bani Juhma for the uh, uh, Christian tribes and uh, uh, Mura. And there will be uh, Samar Rusan, Ar Rusan. These Mashikhat, six of them, were in control of the north, but they were all under the domain of the Bedouin Confederation of the North and as Sardiyya and the Benin Sakhar, who exacted the tribute from all of them. Then, in the middle, there was the two big confederation, tribal confederations. The Benin Sakhar, with around 15 to 1,710 uh, tents, that means around 8,000 people. And the Adwan, with a similar number of their allies, and they fought for supremacy. But Jarash here in the middle was dominated by a certain tribe called Bani Hassan. Now, Bani Hassan, who dominated this area with Mafraq as well, have 11 deputies in our house of 150 House of Deputies. And they think they are not well represented. So. <laughs> They, they compensate them by giving them four num members in the Senate. <laughs> the tribal law still uh, uh, abides, and uh, the Bani Sakhr, who uh, were big, were uh, trying to take lands from the Adwan. So by the 1870s, the uh, areas uh, contested between them finally came to the lot of the Bani Sakhr. And uh, the Sheikh of the Bani Sakhr, Ibn Faiz, around 1880, managed to distribute to his fellow tribesmen 22 villages 
that is nearly a uh, hundred thousand uh, hectares. Uh, and th that land was uh, really good for the production of cereals, mainly wheat. Because in the uh, middle of the 19th century, the R Crimean War uh, put uh, an end to the exports of wheat from the Crimea. And uh, Palestine, which depended mainly on wheat from that air source, uh, started feeding the shortage. So the Jordanians came in quickly with their crops, and they increased the they increased their uh, areas of uh, of wheat production, and that was another good source of income for the Transjordanians. The picture that we have is that of uh, the famous French artist Dumas. It's a photograph of the 1875 period. And it shows my hometown, Salt, which is uh, uh, not, not, not very promising. But uh, anyway, it was a small town of around 3,000 people. And its uh, main claim to importance was that it had 20 shops and dealt with all the Bedouins of the area. This is the other town opposite the salt in Al Karak, in the south of Transjordan. And uh, all these fields that are uh, tilled next around the hill are no more there. But the town was a crusader castle. It was uh, a kingdom for many years, for centuries. And uh, the great feeling of greatness is there in the people of the place where the Majalis, the famous important family, still uh, is the paramount family. Now, when the Ottomans came to, um, uh, to Jordan, Transjordan, for around 250 years, their only interest was in the caravan pilgrimage route because uh, their, uh, their, their sultan claimed himself to be Khadim al Haramain al Sharifain, server of both shrines, holy shrines. So now, all that time, they were looking after the uh, security of the caravan during its passage from Damascus to Medina and back. And uh, in, 18, in uh, 1850, the Ottoman uh, Bab al Ali, the uh, administration, felt that they should uh, resume authority over the areas because the Bedouins were becoming unruly and there have been attacks on certain uh, people here and there and the uh, Ottomans could not afford being less uh, interested in the security and stability of the area than the Egyptians. Because in 1831, Muhammad Ali Pasha of Egypt ordered his son, Ibrahim Pasha, to occupy Bilad al-Sham. Bilad al-Sham was four countries, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Jordan. Now, now he, he did it in, within six months, a great, if, uh, accomplishment, and in his time of uh, occupation for 10 years, he abolished the discrimination between religious groups. He abolished the Khawa, which was the tribute exacted by the Bedouins from the settled people. He uh, stopped the bribery uh, technique, and any uh, body who was caught receiving a bribe or giving a bribe was really uh, severely punished. And it, it's, it's amazing how 10 years of discipline and strict, honest rule changed the whole scene from one of corruption into a better way of life. But the 
Ottomans saw the light and at, uh, at the pressure of the European powers, mainly France and England, uh, Sultan Abdel Majid in 1839 issued what they uh, call in uh, history at Tanzimat. At the period of at Tanzimat, the, uh, uh, the period of uh, realignment was uh, a law issued by the Sultan that there will be no bribery, there will be no tribute, there will be no discrimination, and there will be freedom of religion. And, and, and that's 1839. And from then, uh, people started showing more desire for ownership of land, because there was an assurance of better uh, arrangements. So, uh, the Ottomans came to Salt, uh, to Erbid in 1851. They started an administration in the northern part. In 1867, an expeditionary force of 4,000 occupied Salt. And in, 19, in 1894, uh, uh, Rashid Basha, uh, Hussein Hilmi Basha occupied the Karak completely with an expeditionary force of 3,000 and four guns. And the guns are very important in, uh, in 19th century warfare because people were not accustomed to them and they were really scared when they heard that the Pasha had with him a retinue of uh, four, a battery of four guns. That was a serious threat. Now, they started building their uh, Sarai. The Sarai was the government house. And this one in the, in the picture is the Sarai in El Karak. There was a Sarai uh, bigger than this built in salt. But unfortunately, in 1964, our then prime minister was Fittel, so fit to improve the looks of the town. So he removed the Sarai. It was a wonderful relic. Uh, and the oldest building in town, <laughs> he removed it just like that together with the house of the Bisharats and the house of the Hajj Dahoud, two important families in Salt. So now, but this one still stands, unfortunately, and uh, it's a, an example of where the governor of the whole area uh, uh, so, sort of assumed his duties with 150 uh, cavalry men at his disposal. Please. To give you an idea about the poverty of the land, this is a <laughs> part of southern Jordan near Petra, the famous city of Gordon Times, uh, of the Nabataeans. And uh, this is by an American, Frank Mason Good, in 1866-67, as a photograph. Uh, I think you must, you must have the collection. Now, the Madaba I mentioned, which was occupied by the tribesmen who came from Al Karak, 145 of them came and occupied this place. It was deserted. And then there was a big fight between them and the Sheikh of the Beni Sakhr. But because they switched over en masse from Orthodoxy to Catholicism, the Catholic Patriarch of Jerusalem was very generous and he paid 300 gold pounds, Napoleons, to the, to the Bari Sakhar chief in return for the lands of Madaba. The lands of Madaba was around perhaps 2,000 acres. And uh, now uh, they still are there, but the, uh, the place has grown much in size with the refugees because Jordan at the moment happens to have 800,000 Egyptians, a million and a half Syrians, half a million Iraqis, 100,000 from the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Eritrea, Somalia, etc., as domestics. And the place, I don't know, and six, six million Jordanians, half of them Palestinian, half of them Jordanian. So we are uh, quite a, a, a good mix, a good mix. 
Now, this is again Madaba with the Orthodox Church on the side. This is very important because this uh, has, from the fifth century, a mosaic on the floor of the great map of the East. And it shows in this map Jerusalem with its shrines, the Holy Sepulchre and the other churches, and uh, Decapolis uh, cities, and uh, Bisan, which was another city of the Decapolis. Decapolis it was a union of 10 Greek settler cities that was very strong from 250 BC until 250 AD, 500 years, these 10 cities. Now this one gives you an idea about the Bedouin population of Transjordan in, 18, in, in the 1800s. In 1895, uh, the women all were dressed in black. And uh, uh, very simple requirements in textiles and uh, house utensils. But uh, life was simple and rather sturdy. <coughs> this uh, old-fashioned uh, antique bridge was one uh, on the River Jordan. It was built back in 1891, in 1885. And uh, amazingly, a, a big wave of water came and washed it off in 1891. Uh, the river at that time varied between 35 and 60 feet in width and around 10 feet in depth. Presently, the poor Jordan is short of water and it will be perhaps 30% of these measurements. Now, Amman uh, in, uh, in Ma'an, Ma'an is the city in the south. It was an important railway station when the Germans helped the Ottomans to build the Hijaz Railway at the start of the 20th century. Uh, the train arrived in Ma'an in, uh, in 1905, I think, or 1906, and it became the last stop in Jordan before Hijaz, before Saudi Arabia. When I mentioned the Circassians, <coughs> I said that they arrived, uh, I, I want to say now that they arrived as immigrants from the Bulgarian besieged city of Plevna back in the uh, year 1879. Uthman Pasha, at the head of 30,000 troops, Turkish troops, was besieged in the city and forced to surrender by the Bulgarian free forces. And uh, there was a condition that he goes out with his forces in peace, but also with every settler they brought into the area, into the whole uh, area of that uh, part of Bulgaria. So they, they say that there were around 50,000 uh, refugees who had to be settled somewhere. Bilad al-Sham, that is Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Transjordan, and Palestine, had a very good share of that. The first batch came to Jordan in 1879 with uh, 500 of them. And they, they were allotted lands on the next to the water and dry farming, and they were given money to buy uh, uh, animals and feed. And uh, they were the ones who first brought the wheel back into Transjordan. We did not have any wheels before 1885. And uh, this carriage is uh, <coughs> the famous Circassian wagon that used to uh, carry the crops from the fields to the Bader. Another uh, Damascene carriage that uh, have different wheels and a different uh, tonbor or uh, and uh, 
I remember the first tractor that we ever had in Jordan was in, 18, in 1940. 1940. It was a Caterpillar D8. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, uh, this picture is dear to me because it's my uh, village, Yaduda. Yaduda is uh, an Aramaic word derived from Ya Dudi, my love, uh, in Aramaic. Ya Dudi, my love. And it is our bedar, that is the threshing floor, with part of the labor force and one of the Abu Jabers on horseback, on the white horse, in front of it. Now, these buildings there were <coughs> rather, uh, this is 1920. Four years later, the walls saved the Abu Jabers because we were attacked by a Wahhabi uh, group of 500 men on dromedaries, on camels. And they made the first assault and uh, the, the, the village had only seven guns, seven rifles. And say, so they were all here on this side, and they repulsed them with the orders from the chief, my uncle, to shoot the animals and not the men. Say, spare the men and repulse, the def defend yourselves. And they did. And for eight hours, they were under siege until uh, the uh, Jordanians managed to amass forces and these people had to withdraw after losing 17 dead camels and not one, gil one single uh, injury of men because we did not want to have blood on our hands with the Saudi tribes. The Saudi tribes are famous ones of Aniza, Rwala, Shammar, and they are too formidable to be <laughs> enemies. This is how Yadude looks from afar. And when I uh, show this picture, I show that in 1970, there was uh, no urban settlements around us. Unfortunately, there, you can't see this again in Jordan now. The, the place is overcrowded. We are short of water. We are short of funds to keep the refugees. We are short of money for development, and the wealth is really uh, difficult, this what? Huh? All right, This uh, a famous uh, traveler in Jordan, amongst the travelers, was uh, Gertrude Bell. Gertrude Bell was an English uh, foreign office agent who had uh, the mission to deal with the Hashemite princes and King Hussein bin Ali back in the Great War in 1914-1918. Uh, she came, uh, prior to that, she in her travels came to Jordan twice. Once in 1905, and she came to Salt and gave us a good report about the town. And then she wrote, in, she came again in 1914 and stayed for two nights at Yaduda. And she took this picture of the group of the people in Yaduda with this man as my grand, great grandfather and uh, his brother. And this is a Bisharat Salti Pasha. Salti Pasha Bisharat. Anyway, uh, she took this picture and uh, left Jordan to London, and in 1916, she was put in office. In 1921, she was the uh, force behind the uh, arrangements made in Iraq where King Faisal uh, Ibn Hussein, Ibn Ali, was made king of Iraq. Uh, another uh, tent. Ah, this photo is really uh, a rare one. It's the sons of the paramount chiefs of the Adwan. And the Adwan were the tribe, the confederation actually, that was in charge 
of the Balqa district. And the Balqa district is the area from Amman to the Jordan Valley and from the Zarqa River to the, Yarm to the Mujib. Uh, they were uh, ferociously looking, looking, very well armed, and they exacted tribute f from the fallahin, from the farmers in the area, until the Bani Sakhir contested that right and uh, stopped it after Ibrahim Pasha came to the country. They still own most of the Jordan Valley lands. This is uh, a group of farmers during winter, and the, the striking thing in it is that they all used the skins of lambs to make uh, fair coats because the cold was very uh, deep. And uh, uh, the, the man in the middle uh, may have been an irregular soldier as the as he wears an army overcoat. This is uh, probably from the Palestine Exploration Fund collection, which has a wonderful uh, number of uh, uh, photographs. This is one of the chiefs of the Bani Sakhr, uh, who were the other, uh, and the, the, those who challenged the authority of the Adwan in the middle of Jordan, yes? And these are the boys in a school in Madaba. And uh, one is surprised by the varying ages. Some of them are, uh, but they all went, wanted to learn to read and write, and they went to the same class. Uh, sheep have been always the source of income in Jordan for most of the people. But this picture is uh, far more important because it shows the facade of the Mushatta Palace in the Jordanian uh, Badia. Uh, it, this uh, facade was, this picture is prior to 1900 uh, because this, in 1905, was uh, cut the, the facade was cut in pieces and dispatched to Germany as a present from the Sultan of Turkey, of the Ottoman Sultan, Abdel Hamid, to his very good friend, Kaiser Willem II in Germany. And uh, when one goes to Berlin now to the Pygmalion uh, uh, Museum, uh, you, you see that they have kept it well. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. If it was left there, it would have been damaged, I'm sure. <laughs> this is how a Jordanian family uh, could look back in 1880. Uh, I like the young man with the cigarette <laughs> on the side. <laughs> yeah. uh, for our womanhood, there was much labor to be done. And this woman is shaking the skin that has the yogurt, and that this shaking results in making the cream, the cream as a butter. Now the Jordanians had developed, a, and the, the whole Bilad Sham in Syria, greater Syria, we developed a system whereby this butter is boiled with the little uh, granules of uh, cereals and then uh, with some herbs added, and then you get the samne. And the samne was a very precious article and very, and considered the uh, image of good eating, of good food. And th this woman is making it. Yeah. Now, water was a very precious material. And uh, these skins were used to uh, uh, transport water. Uh, they are goat skins that are filled with perhaps 30, 40 liters of water each and put on the backs of donkeys for transport. Life was very simple. And uh, as my uh, very good friend, the late Albert 
Horani in Oxford used to say when he wrote the foreword to my first book, uh, Transjordan was a country, an area, not a country, an area where standards were shifting quickly and the eternal conflict between those who wanted to till the land and those who wanted to use the land as pasture for their uh, flocks of sheep and herds of cattle was eternal. The, uh, he said the amazing thing in Jordan is that the Jordanians managed to strike a balance between this part and this part, and they together uh, sort of managed to create this uh, kingdom, which is now uh, a pioneer in Jordan. We still have relative stability, security, a certain realization that what is happening in Syria and elsewhere, especially Iraq, Baghdad, uh, should not be allowed to happen to us. I'm grateful to say that uh, the catastrophe happening around us has opened the eyes and the minds of our people. And I hope that within the coming year or two, we shall be able to uh, help the Syrian refugees who have come to us, a million and a half at least. And uh, because uh, really our resources are not at all available to cope with the number like, like that for a long period of time. With these, with these blessings, yes, with these uh, remarks, I'd say that uh, I want to confirm that the Jordanians have always uh, been uh, believers uh, that Allah Berzik, the Almighty, will provide. Thank you very much. I'm at your disposal. <laughs> The yes. arrangement of water at the present time. Well, we we have difficulties all over. We have uh, built in the last ten years around eleven dams. But uh, we are speaking of a million and a half who want sixty would need sixty liters a day. So you can imagine nine uh, million liters every day extra on the, on the meager supply that we have. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Syrians have uh, difficulties in arranging the water for the Yarmouk River. You know, between Syria and Jordan, there is the Yarmouk River. On the western side, we have shortages because of the Jordan River is being regulated all the time. The Jordan, the Dead Sea is shrinking every year with around a meter, meter and a half every year. That's why they are seriously considering the possibility of a canal from Aqaba into the Dead Sea, from sea level to 400 below sea level, pumping over the hills and then down to raise again the level of the Dead Sea to acceptable uh, standards. We, uh, uh, I think the international community is seriously called upon to assist Jordan in its drive uh, in uh, improving the uh, lot of its people with water supply at least. Thank you.
سوري سوري لا انت بدك تشرحي لي بس ما حاش انا Fortunately, the uh, main culture is Arab. So in that respect, that is a blessing. The Syrians are Arabs. We, we've always considered ourselves southern Syria. The Palestinians, our neighbors on the right who came during the Arab-Israeli wars, are Arabs as well. The Iraqis are, the Egyptians are Arabs, so there is no problem in that. Uh, but uh, I, I must, I dare to say that it, in a way it has been useful because it has introduced us to the culture and poetry and uh, uh, novels of the uh, incoming people. I mean, uh, I, I came across few Iraqi poets in Amman the other day. I was really, uh, I, I would have never had that chance if they stayed in Iraq. So uh, we, we are, and at the moment, we are trying in our cultural uh, uh, conferences and in our uh, uh, clubs to uh, sort of make use of that opportunity and ask them to speak to us about their own setups back home. Uh, in that respect, there is no problem because of the homogeneity of the language and the culture. But the uh, trouble is social. The trouble is one of standards of living, of having to put up 167,000 people in one camp with containers for ev with a container for every family if you can uh, it's not very healthy it's not very uh, becoming a human uh, dignified life i'm sorry to say because there are complaints about living conditions in the camps this we had experience back in 1960-48 we had in 1967 we had in 1970 three, and we are having now again. Jordanians, it seems to be our uh, lot always to suffer and, uh, yeah. Okay, I think this is the end of our presentation. Let's give a hand to our... Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.